This is Reed Daly's Come Follow Me podcast. In this podcast series, lesson and scripture audio are combined for a hands-free experience. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kindly granting permission to use the audio content heard in this podcast. We express our gratitude for their generosity. At the end of this podcast, you can hear our full disclosure statement or read it on readdaily.live. March 1st through the 7th, Doctrine and Covenants sections 20 through 22, The Rise of the Church of Christ. As you read Doctrine and Covenants sections 20 through 22, be open to the impressions of the Holy Ghost. Consider recording them so you can refer back to them. The work of these last days is one of vast magnitude. Its glories are past description, and its grandeur unsurpassable. As the restoration continues, I know God will continue to reveal many great and important things pertaining to His kingdom here on earth. The Prophet Joseph Smith's work of translating the Book of Mormon was now complete, but the work of the Restoration had only just begun. It was clear from earlier revelations that, in addition to restoring doctrine and priesthood authority, the Lord wanted to restore a formal organization, His Church. See Doctrine and Covenants section 10 verse 53 and section 18 verse 5. And for this cause have I said, If this generation harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them. Wherefore, if you shall build up my church upon the foundation of my gospel and my rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So on April 6, 1830, More than 40 believers crowded into the Whitmer's family log home in Fayette, New York, to witness the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ. Still, some people wonder, why is an organized church necessary? The answer may be found, at least in part, in the revelations connected with that first church meeting in 1830. Here, blessings are described that would not be possible if the true Church of Jesus Christ had not been regularly organized and established in the latter days. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verse 1. The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh, it being regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country, by the will and commandments of God, in the fourth month and on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. See also Saints, Volume 1, pages 84 through 86. Almost immediately after the Book of Mormon was published, Joseph and Oliver prepared to organize the Church of Jesus Christ. Several months earlier, the Lord's ancient apostles Peter, James, and John had appeared to them and conferred on them the Melchizedek priesthood, as John the Baptist had promised. This additional authority allowed Joseph and Oliver to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost on those they baptized. Peter, James, and John had also ordained them to be apostles of Jesus Christ. Around that time, while staying in the Whitmer home, Joseph and Oliver had prayed for more knowledge about this authority. In reply, the voice of the Lord commanded them to ordain each other elders of the church, but not until believers consented to follow them as leaders in the Savior's church. They were also told to ordain other church officers and confer the gift of the Holy Ghost on those who had been baptized. 
On April 6, 1830, Joseph and Oliver met in the Whitmer home to follow the Lord's commandment and organize his church. To fulfill the requirements of the law, they chose six people to become the first members of the new church. Around 40 women and men also crowded into and around the small home to witness the occasion. In obedience to the Lord's earlier instructions, Joseph and Oliver asked the congregation to sustain them as leaders in the kingdom of God and indicate if they believed it was right for them to organize as a church. Every member of the congregation consented, and Joseph laid his hands on Oliver's head and ordained him an elder of the church. Then they traded places, and Oliver ordained Joseph. Afterward, they administered the bread and wine of the sacrament in remembrance of Christ's atonement. They then laid hands on those they had baptized, confirming them members of the church and giving them the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Lord's Spirit was poured out on those in the meeting, and some in the congregation began to prophesy. Others praised the Lord, and all rejoiced together. Joseph also received the first revelation addressed to the whole body of the new church. Behold, there shall be a record kept among you, the Lord commanded, reminding his people that they were to write their sacred history, preserving an account of their actions, and witnessing to Joseph's role as prophet, seer, and revelator. Him have I inspired to move the cause of Zion in mighty power for good, the Lord declared. His word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. For by doing these things the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Later, Joseph stood beside a stream and witnessed the baptisms of his mother and father into the church. After years of taking different paths in their search for truth, they were finally united in faith. As his father came out of the water, Joseph took him by the hand, helped him onto the bank, and embraced him. My God, he cried, burying his face in his father's chest. I have lived to see my father baptized into the true church of Jesus Christ. That evening, Joseph slipped away into some nearby woods, his heart bursting with emotion. He wanted to be alone, out of sight of friends and family. In the ten years since his first vision, he had seen the heavens open, felt the Spirit of God, and been tutored by angels. He had also sinned and lost his gift, only to repent, receive God's mercy, and translate the Book of Mormon by his power and grace. Now Jesus Christ had restored his church and authorized Joseph with the same priesthood that apostles had held anciently when they carried the gospel to the world. The happiness he felt was too much for him to hold in, and when Joseph Knight and Oliver found him later that night, he was weeping. His joy was full. The work had begun. And build up my church. See Revelations in Context, pages 29 through 32. Build up my church. Doctrine and Covenants, sections 18, 20, 21, and 22. By Jeffrey G. Cannon. Standing on the shore, Joseph Smith reached down and clasped his father's hand after Oliver Cowdery raised the elder Smith from the water. Oh, my God, I have lived to see my father baptized into the true church of Jesus Christ, Joseph exclaimed. His joy was too much for him. He looked for a place to get away. Friends Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Knight went after him. Knight later described Joseph as being the most wrought upon that I ever saw any man. For years, Joseph Smith Sr. had dismissed the claims of contemporary churchmen, but now he found the truth he sought in the visions and revelations of his son Joseph Jr. The Church of Christ was organized on April 6, 1830, and Joseph Sr. was one of the first to be baptized. As early as the summer of 1828, Joseph Smith Jr.'s revelations had discussed establishing a church. In the aftermath of Martin Harris's loss of the first 116 pages of the Book of Mormon manuscript, Joseph dictated a revelation in which the Lord stated, I will establish my church. It was becoming clear that Joseph Smith's mission would not end with the translation of the plates. Yet even believing associates like Joseph Knight were unaware of preparations Joseph and Oliver seemed to be keeping close to the vest. 
Knight later recalled that he did not learn of the impending church organization until shortly before the actual event. Now in the spring of 1830, he recalled, I went with my team and took Joseph out to Manchester to his father. When we was on our way, he told me that there must be a church formed, but did not tell when. Preparations had been underway since at least June 1829. In that month, Joseph Smith dictated the revelation for Oliver Cowdery that would become Doctrine and Covenants, Section 18. In it, Oliver was instructed to build up my church and my gospel and my rock. In doing so, Cowdery was told to rely upon the things which are written. The Book of Mormon translation was nearly finished, and Cowdery indeed used the manuscript as he began to outline the polity of the new church. Cowdery produced a document he called Articles of the Church of Christ in preparation for the organization of the church. Much of this document was either a direct quotation or a close paraphrase from the Book of Mormon manuscript. Like the Nephite church, this new church would have priests and teachers. It would also have disciples or elders. The June 1829 revelation also appointed Cowdery, along with David Whitmer, to select twelve who would serve as the apostles sent out to spread the new church's message. Many of those who accepted that message awaited the organization of a church. About this time, Joseph Smith announced a revelation specifying that the church should be organized on April 6, 1830. On that day, forty or fifty men and women gathered in the small Fayette home of Peter Whitmer Sr. to observe the event. Six of them, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and four others, served as the official organizers. They opened the meeting by solemn prayer. Joseph and Oliver asked the other four official members if they would accept them as their spiritual teachers and whether they should proceed to organize the church. Having the consent of the assembled believers, Joseph ordained Oliver Cowdery an elder in the church, and Oliver did the same for Joseph. Joseph was twenty-four years old at the time. Oliver was twenty-three. With authorized men called, sustained, and ordained, it was possible for the church to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We then took bread, blessed it, and break it with them, also wine, blessed it, and drank it with them. After the sacrament, Joseph Smith's history records, We then laid our hands on each individual member of the church present that they might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and be confirmed members of the Church of Christ. The Holy Ghost was poured out upon us to a very great degree. Some prophesied, whilst we all praised the Lord and rejoiced exceedingly. That same day, whilst yet together for the organizational meeting, Joseph Smith received another revelation. Now known as Doctrine and Covenants, Section 21, the revelation instructed the newly formed church that there shall a record be kept among you, in which Joseph Smith would be known as a seer and translator and prophet and apostle of Jesus Christ and elder of the church. Oliver Cowdery, acting in his role as apostle and elder, was to perform the ordination. Though Oliver was designated the church's second elder, the April 6th revelation also designated him the first preacher, an office he filled by preaching the church's first public sermon on April 11th. While Joseph and Oliver's respective roles were clarified, the role Oliver's Articles of the Church of Christ played in the organization is unclear. Some time after Oliver had completed the articles, Joseph told him there was more. Joseph's superseding revelation, now part of Doctrine and Covenants section 20, seems to have been completed after the organizational meeting in April, but before the Church's first conference held in June. At the June conference, this revealed document was accepted as a statement of polity for the new church. Its importance was highlighted by the fact that it was the first revelatory text published in the church's newspaper, and it was later printed as Section 2 of the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, after the preface dictated as a revelation in 1835. During the two months between the organization of the Church and its acceptance of the new articles in June, 
questions arose concerning the need of believers to be baptized if they had previously been baptized in other churches. Within weeks of the first meeting of the church, Joseph Smith received a revelation, now Doctrine and Covenants, section 22, emphasizing the importance of rebaptism in the new church. The new Church of Christ was more than simply another Christian denomination. After years of keeping a distance from the churches he saw around him, Joseph Smith Sr. saw in the restored church something different, a legitimate successor to the apostolic church with prophets, apostles, revelation, and authority. Ideas for Personal Scripture Study Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verses 1 through 36. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is founded on true doctrine. Section 20 is introduced as a revelation on church organization and government. See the section heading. But before outlining church policies, priesthood offices, and procedures for performing ordinances, this revelation begins by teaching fundamental doctrine. As you read the first 36 verses of this revelation, ask yourself why that might be. You might also make a list of the gospel truths you find. Here are some examples. The Book of Mormon and its role in the Restoration. See verses 8 through 12. And gave him power from on high, by the means which were before prepared, to translate the Book of Mormon, which contains a record of a fallen people, and the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to the Jews also, which was given by inspiration, and is confirmed to others by the ministering of angels, and is declared unto the world by them, proving to the world that the holy scriptures are true, and that God does inspire men and call them to his holy work in this age and generation, as well as in generations of old thereby showing that he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. The Nature of God, verses 17-19 through 19. By these things we know that there is a God in heaven, who is infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth, and all things which are in them, and that he created man, male and female, after his own image, and in his own likeness created he them, and gave unto them commandments that they should love and serve him, the only living and true God, and that he should be the only being whom they should worship. The Atonement of Jesus Christ, verses 20 through 27. But by the transgression of these holy laws, man became sensual and devilish, and became fallen man. Wherefore, the Almighty God gave his only begotten Son, as it is written in those scriptures which have been given of him. He suffered temptations, but gave no heed unto them. He was crucified, died, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven to sit down on the right hand of the Father to reign with almighty power according to the will of the Father, that as many as would believe and be baptized in his holy name and endure in faith to the end, should be saved. Not only those who believed after he came in the meridian of time, in the flesh, but all those from the beginning, even as many as were before he came, who believed in the words of the holy prophets who spake as they were inspired by the gift of the Holy Ghost, who truly testified of him in all things, should have eternal life, as well as those who should come after, who should believe in the gifts and callings of God by the Holy Ghost, which beareth record of the Father and of the Son. Why would these truths be important to emphasize as the Church was being established? Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verses 37 and 75 through 79. Sacred ordinances are an essential part of the restored church. When the church was organized, the Lord taught his saints about sacred ordinances, including baptism and the sacrament. 
As you read the instructions concerning the manner of baptism in verse 37, think about your own baptism. And again, by way of commandment to the church concerning the manner of baptism, all those who humble themselves before God and desire to be baptized and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve Him to the end, and truly manifest by their works that they have received of the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins, shall be received by baptism into His church. Did you have any of the feelings described in this verse? Do you have them now? Ponder what you can do to keep vibrant your determination to serve Jesus Christ to the end. As you read about the sacrament in Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verses 75 through 79, try to read these sacred prayers from the perspective of someone hearing them for the first time. It is expedient that the church meet together often to partake of bread and wine in the remembrance of the Lord Jesus, and the elder or priest shall administer it, and after this manner shall he administer it. He shall kneel with the church and call upon the Father in solemn prayer, saying, O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. The manner of administering the wine. He shall take the cup also and say, O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. What insights do you receive about the sacrament? about yourself. How might these insights affect the way you prepare to take the sacrament this week? Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verses 38 through 60. Priesthood service blesses church members and their families. If someone asked you to name the duties of a priesthood holder, what would you say? Read Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verses 38 through 60, which list the duties of various priesthood offices. The duty of the elders, priests, teachers, deacons, and members of the Church of Christ. An apostle is an elder, and it is his calling to baptize, and to ordain other elders, priests, teachers, and deacons, and to administer bread and wine, the emblems of the flesh and blood of Christ, and to confirm those who are baptized into the Church by the laying on of hands for the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, according to the Scriptures, and to teach, expound, exhort, baptize, and watch over the Church, and to confirm the Church by the laying on of the hands and the giving of the Holy Ghost, and to take the lead of all meetings. The elders are to conduct the meetings as they are led by the Holy Ghost, according to the commandments and revelations of God. The priest's duty is to preach, teach, expound, exhort, and baptize, and administer the sacrament, and visit the house of each member, and exhort them to pray vocally and in secret, and attend to all family duties. And he may also ordain other priests, teachers, and deacons. And he is to take the lead of meetings when there is no elder present. But when there is an elder present, he is only to preach, 
teach, expound, exhort, and baptize, and visit the house of each member, exhorting them to pray vocally and in secret, and attend to all family duties. In all these duties the priest is to assist the elder if occasion requires. The teacher's duty is to watch over the church always, and be with and strengthen them, and see that there is no iniquity in the church, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, nor evil speaking, and see that the church meet together often, and also see that all the members do their duty, and he is to take the lead of meetings in the absence of the elder or priest, and is to be assisted always in all his duties in the church by the deacons if occasion requires. But neither teachers nor deacons have authority to baptize, administer the sacrament, or lay on hands. They are, however, to warn, expound, exhort, and teach, and invite all to come unto Christ. Every elder, priest, teacher, or deacon is to be ordained according to the gifts and callings of God unto him, and he is to be ordained by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is in the one who ordains him. Does anything in these verses change the way you think about priesthood duties? and how the Savior does His work? How have you been blessed by the work described in these verses? To learn about how women exercise priesthood authority in the work of the Church, see Dallin H. Oaks, The Keys and Authority of the Priesthood, and signed or Leahona, May 2014. At this conference, we have seen the release of some faithful brothers, and we have sustained the callings of others. In this rotation, so familiar in the Church, we do not step down when we are released, and we do not step up when we are called. There is no up or down in the service of the Lord. There is only forward or backward, and that difference depends on how we accept and act upon our releases and our callings. I once presided at the release of a young stake president who had given fine service for nine years and was now rejoicing in his release and in the new calling he and his wife had just received. They were called to be the nursery leaders in their ward. Only in this Church would that be seen as equally honorable. While addressing a women's conference, President Linda K. Burton of the Relief Society said, We hope to instill within each of us a greater desire to better understand the priesthood. That need applies to all of us, and I will pursue it by speaking of the keys and authority of the priesthood. Since these subjects are of equal concern to men and to women, I am pleased that these proceedings are broadcast and published for all members of the Church. Priesthood power blesses all of us. Priesthood keys direct women as well as men. And priesthood ordinances and priesthood authority pertain to women as well as men. President Joseph F. Smith described the priesthood as the power of God delegated to man by which man can act in the earth for the salvation of the human family. Other leaders have taught us that the priesthood is the consummate power on this earth. It is the power by which the earth was created. The scriptures teach that this same priesthood, which was in the beginning, shall be in the end of the world also. Thus, the priesthood is the power by which we will be resurrected and proceed to eternal life. The understanding we seek begins with an understanding of the keys of the priesthood. Priesthood keys are the authority God has given to priesthood holders to direct, control, and govern the use of His priesthood on the earth. Every act or ordinance performed in the Church is done under the direct or indirect authorization 
of one holding the keys for that function. As Elder M. Russell Ballard has explained, those who have priesthood keys literally make it possible for all who serve faithfully under their direction to exercise priesthood authority and have access to priesthood power. In controlling the exercise of priesthood authority, the function of priesthood keys both enlarges and limits. It enlarges by making it possible for priesthood authority and blessings to be available for all of God's children. It limits by directing who will be given the authority of the priesthood, who will hold its offices, and how its rights and powers will be conferred. <clears throat> for example, a person who holds the priesthood is not able to confer his office or authority on another unless authorized by one who holds the keys. Without that authorization, the ordination would be invalid. This explains why a priesthood holder, regardless of office, cannot ordain a member of his family or administer the sacrament in his own home without authorization from the one who holds the appropriate keys. With the exception of the sacred work that sisters do in the temple under the keys held by the temple president, which I will describe hereafter, only one who holds a priesthood office can officiate in a priesthood ordinance, and all authorized priesthood ordinances are recorded on the records of the Church. <clears throat> Ultimately, all keys of the priesthood are held by the Lord Jesus Christ, whose priesthood it is. He is the one who determines what keys are delegated to mortals and how those keys will be used. We are accustomed to thinking that all keys of the priesthood were conferred on Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple, but the scripture states that all that was conferred there were the keys of this dispensation. At General Conference many years ago, President Spencer W. Kimball reminded us that there are other priesthood keys that have not been given to man on the earth, including the keys of creation and resurrection. The divine nature of the limitations put upon the exercise of priesthood keys explains an essential contrast between decisions on matters of Church administration and decisions affecting the priesthood. The First Presidency and the Council of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, who preside over the Church, are empowered to make many decisions affecting Church policies and procedures, matters such as the location of Church buildings and the ages for missionary service. But even though these presiding authorities hold and exercise all of the keys delegated to men in this dispensation, they are not free to alter the divinely decreed pattern that only men will hold offices in the priesthood. I come now to the subject of priesthood authority. I begin with the three principles just discussed. One, priesthood is the power of God delegated to man to act for the salvation of the human family. Two, priesthood authority is governed by priesthood holders who hold priesthood keys. And three, since the scriptures state that all other authorities and offices in the Church are appendages to this Melchizedek priesthood, all that is done under the direction of those priesthood keys is done with priesthood authority. How does this apply to women? In an address to the Relief Society, President Joseph Fielding Smith, then president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, said this, While the sisters have not been given the priesthood, it has not been conferred upon them, 
That does not mean that the Lord has not given unto them authority. A person may have authority given to him or a sister to her to do certain things in the church that are binding and absolutely necessary for our salvation, such as the work that our sisters do in the house of the Lord. They have authority given unto them to do some great and wonderful things, sacred unto the Lord, and binding just as thoroughly as are the blessings that are given by men who hold the priesthood." End of quote. In that notable address, President Smith said again and again that women have been given authority. To the women, he said, you can speak with authority because the Lord has placed authority upon you. He also said that the Relief Society has been given power and authority to do a great many things. The work which they do is done by divine authority. End of quote. And, of course, the church work done by women or men, whether in the temple or in the wards or branches, is done under the direction of those who hold priesthood keys. Thus, speaking of the Relief Society, President Smith explained, The Lord has given to them this great organization where they have authority to serve under the direction of the bishops of the wards looking after the interests of our people, both spiritually and temporally." End of quote. Thus, it is truly said that Relief Society is not just a class for women, but something they belong to, a divinely established appendage to the priesthood. We are not accustomed to speaking of women having the authority of the priesthood in their church callings. But what other authority can it be? When a woman, young or old, is set apart to preach the gospel as a full-time missionary, she is given priesthood authority to perform a priesthood function. The same is true when a woman is set apart to function as an officer or teacher in a church organization under the direction of one who holds the keys of the priesthood. Whoever functions in an office or calling received from one who holds priesthood keys exercises priesthood authority in performing her or his assigned duties. Whoever exercises priesthood authority should forget about their rights and concentrate on their responsibilities. That is a principle needed in society at large. The famous Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn is quoted as saying, It is time to defend not so much human rights as human obligations. Latter-day Saints surely recognize that qualifying for exaltation is not a matter of asserting rights, but a matter of fulfilling responsibilities. The Lord has directed that only men will be ordained to offices in the priesthood. But, as various Church leaders have emphasized, men are not the priesthood. Men hold the priesthood with a sacred duty to use it for the blessing of all of the children of God. The greatest power God has given to His sons cannot be exercised without the companionship of one of his daughters, because only to his daughters has God given the power to be a creator of bodies so that God's design and the great plan might meet fruition. Those are the words of President J. Reuben Clark. He continued, quote, This is the place of our wives and of our mothers in the eternal plan. They are not bearers of the priesthood. They are not charged with carrying out the duties and functions of the priesthood, nor are they laden with its responsibilities. They are builders and organizers under its power and partakers of its blessings, possessing the complement of the priesthood powers 
and possessing a function as divinely called, as eternally important in its place as the priesthood itself." End of quote. In those inspired words, President Clark was speaking of the family. As stated in the family proclamation, the father presides in the family and he and the mother have separate responsibilities, but they are obligated to help one another as equal partners. Some years before the family proclamation, President Spencer W. Kimball gave this inspired explanation. When we speak of marriage as a partnership, let us speak of marriage as a full partnership. We do not want our LDS women to be silent partners or limited partners in that eternal assignment. Please be a contributing and full partner." End of quote. In the eyes of God, whether in the Church or in the family, women and men are equal with different responsibilities. I close with some truths about the blessings of the priesthood. Unlike priesthood keys and priesthood ordinations, the blessings of the priesthood are available to women and to men on the same terms. The gift of the Holy Ghost and the blessings of the temple are familiar illustrations of this truth. In his insightful talk at BYU Education Week last summer, Elder M. Russell Ballard gave these teachings. Our Church doctrine places women equal to and yet different from men. God does not regard either gender as better or more important than the other. When men and women go to the temple, they are both endowed with the same power, which is priesthood power. Access to the power and blessings of the priesthood is available to all of God's children. End of quote. I testify of the power and blessings of the priesthood of God, available for His sons and daughters alike. I testify of the authority of the priesthood, which functions throughout all of the offices and activities of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I testify of the divinely directed function of the keys of the priesthood, held and exercised in their fullness by our Prophet President Thomas S. Monson. Finally, and most important, I testify of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whose priesthood this is and whose servants we are. In the name of Jesus Christ. Doctrine and Covenants, Section 21. The Church of Jesus Christ is led by a living prophet. What do you learn from Doctrine and Covenants, Section 21, verses 4 through 9, about the words of the Lord's prophets? Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments which he shall give unto you, as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. For by doing these things the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you, and cause the heavens to shake for your good, and his name's glory. For thus saith the Lord God, Him have I inspired to move the cause of Zion in mighty power for good, and his diligence I know, and his prayers I have heard. Yea, his weeping for Zion I have seen, and I will cause that he shall mourn for her no longer. For his days of rejoicing are come unto the remission of his sins and the manifestations of my blessings upon his works. For behold, I will bless all those who labor in my vineyard with a mighty blessing, and they shall believe on his words which are given him through me by the Comforter, which manifesteth that Jesus was crucified by sinful men for the sins of the world yea, for the remission of sins unto the contrite heart. 
Consider the promises described in verse 6 for those who receive the Lord's word through his prophet. What do these promises mean to you? How can you receive the living prophet's word as if from God's own mouth? See verse 5. What counsel has today's prophet given that could lead you to the blessings promised in verse 6? Ideas for Family Scripture Study and Home Evening Doctrine and Covenants Section 20 What would we say if someone asked us why we need the church? What answers do we find in Doctrine and Covenants Section 20? See also D. Todd Christofferson, Why the Church? Ensign or Leahona, November 2015 Doctrine and Covenants Section 20, Verse 69 What does it mean to walk in holiness before the Lord? It might be fun for family members to draw or write on pieces of paper some things that could help them walk in holiness, or things that could distract them from doing so. Then they could create a path using the papers and try to walk on the path, stepping only on the drawings that will bring them to Christ. Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verse 37 and verses 71 through 74. If someone in your family is not yet baptized, these verses could lead to a discussion about how to prepare for baptism. See verse 37, and how baptisms are performed. See verses 71 through 74. Family members could share pictures or memories from their baptismal day. Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verses 75 through 79. How could your family use these verses to prepare for meaningful, reverent experiences with the sacrament? These verses might suggest things you could ponder during the sacrament, and family members could find or draw pictures of those things. As appropriate, you might bring those pictures to your next sacrament meeting as a reminder of what to think about during the sacrament. Doctrine and Covenants, section 21, verses 4 through 7. Consider inviting family members to look for words and phrases in verses 4 through 5 that teach us about following the Lord's prophet. What does it mean to receive the prophet's words in patience, in faith? When have we received the blessings promised in verse 6? For more ideas for teaching children, see this week's outline in Come Follow Me for Primary. Suggested Song, The Church of Jesus Christ. See Children's Songbook, number 77. Improving Our Teaching. Emulate the Savior's Life. Quote, The Savior's power to teach and lift others came from the way He lived and the kind of person He was. The more diligently you strive to live like Jesus Christ, the more you will be able to teach like Him. End quote. See Teaching in the Savior's Way, page 13. Thank you for listening to Read Daily's Come Follow Me podcast. Please share this podcast with family members and friends who can find us on readdaily.live or their favorite podcast application. The Intellectual Property Department of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kindly granting permission to use the audio content heard in this podcast. We express our gratitude for their generosity. Along with granting permission, they ask that we make the following statement. Any products offered by ReadDaily.Live are neither made, provided, approved, nor endorsed by Intellectual Reserve, Inc. or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any content or opinions expressed, implied, or included with any goods or services offered by ReadDaily.Live are solely those of Howard Patrick Holman and not those of Intellectual Reserve, Inc. or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you.